Hello and welcome to this, the latest edition of Enlit Asia's interview series. Today we're discussing blockchain, something that has been much talked about over the last few years as being transformational in the way in which we complete transactions within the energy sector. I have the pleasure of being joined by two representatives from Siemens, Professor Dr. Monica Sturm, Principal Key Expert in Digitalization, and Maria Rosbander, Strategic Marketing, Innovation and Blockchain Expert. Together we will dive a little deeper into the subject and discuss its advantages and disadvantages over how we currently do business, its true potential, and how it might be applied to, to the ASEAN power and electricity sector. Uh, Monica and Maria, hello, and thank you both very much for joining me. Thank you very much. Um, as I mentioned in the introduction to this discussion, blockchain-based distributed ledger technologies have been one of those things that has featured in discussions across the energy value chain for some time. It would be interesting, though, to, to touch on its beginnings. How did it all start, and, and can you give us a simple explanation of the technology? Sure. Thank you for having the opportunity to have the talk with you, Simon. And let me start. Um, blockchain, and I personally prefer more the term DLT, um, is something uh, which we are very much interested in. And I would like to give you a short uh, and hopefully technical, easy explanation. So DLT for me is a robust term that refers to a distributed storage of data on a shared ledger, which enables the exchange of value or data between uh, all the network participants. Um, and the uh, exchange of value will be done in a very trusted way. So to summarize it, it's a kind of new internet protocol which offers a controlled data exchange within the partners in the ecosystem. But Maria, maybe you can give us even a simpler example. Yes, thank you. So what really made the difference for me was the example that was introduced um, um, with the mirror, so it's the mirror example. So imagine yourself, you're looking into a mirror, so you get this one information, so that is the picture of yourself. But then now um, 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 imagine that mirror would scatter into 1,000 pieces, and still every piece of that mirror contains the same information, so that is the picture of me. So you have this decentralized, trusted information that is scattered throughout all the different pieces. So that really helped me understand what blockchain or DLT actually is. Yes. Thank you, Maria. Great example. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the history of blockchain. So the blockchain really incorporates three branches of uh, mathematics. It's crypto, uh, cryptography, or cryptography, uh, distributed system, and game theory. So all these um, technologies started already 40 years ago. Let me summarize some of the main development steps. I would like to mention the first one, 1979 by Merkel, the Merkel tree um, uh, um, research. Um, then the next one, which I really think of, it's very important, it was uh, 1982 by Le Leslie Lamport, the Bitsitin fault tolerant consensus algorithm. He really described the Bitsitin general problem in a very nice way. Um, and next milestone, I would name 1997, um, the smart contracts by Nick Sabo. And something which I think is very famous already was the white paper by Satoshi Nakamoto, um, the Bitcoin uh, white paper 2008. Mm -hmm. so I think these were the ground um, technologies um, for blockchain. And looking in the, um, yeah, looking what has happened in the, uh, in the past years, 2013, I would really like to mention the white paper from Ethereum, um, which really opens a complete new way of making use of this technology. Having said that, I would say, um, blockchain, um, the first version was mainly around cryptocurrency. Some um, colleagues describe it at blockchain uh, 0.1. Then blockchain 0.2 uh, was the area where we were able to really make use of the smart contracts to enable autonomous uh, interaction uh, between, uh, for example, devices. And I believe we are now in the blockchain 0.3, where uh, really um, the decentralized application started and some people are already talking about blockchain 0.4, where we really now industrialize uh, this new technology. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, we'll jump ahead to where we left off. Um, are there any changes in the way companies will cooperate in the future as a result of blockchain technologies? Absolutely. So, um, you know, what do we see currently? Currently, we see that the big tech companies really create walled gardens. Yeah, I'm talking about these centralized uh, platforms. Um, and we everybody understands that there is a big benefit in having these centralized plat uh, uh, platforms uh, where one partner is owning the control of the whole e ecosystem. We often hear something like um, the winner takes it all. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, and there is currently this big attitude, how can we change it? Uh, are there any new approaches to decentralize the platform monopolies and to create common own platforms? And we are using um, for this approach, the term competition, where in an ecosystem, we work in a collaborative way together to design the IT infrastructure, to design the network, um, and to design the governance, and also work in a collaborative way with our partners to define how we can access the data on that uh, in that network and how we can make use of these data. And if we have this type of collaboration you know, within an ecosystem, uh, done with our partners, we would then um, open a layer where every partner could offer and build its own service on top of it, but this layer would be in, comp uh, in competition. So this is why we call it uh, co-petition. Um, there is an area where we cooperate in order to enable co-petition on the top of it. And we currently see that this is really something which is very well taken. And I really believe that this is uh, the approach to make the technology more feasible for many players and for many users in the, in, in the market. Okay, okay. Um, looking specifically then at, at the region in which uh, I am now, uh, at Southeast Asia, um, distributed energy is set to play a significant role in the region. How can blockchain and peer-to-peer and -peer trading unlock, it, unlock the opportunities that exist here? What viable solutions exist and that, that, that we might see implemented? Yeah, so, and here, I would also like to refer what we see in the market um, to, mm -hmm. to give an example. So first of all, of course, peer-to-peer -peer energy, um, that is always, that always includes conversation with the regulator. So you can't just do that. It takes, um, you need to, have this ecosystem approach also and it usually is about green energy for example you have solar energy on your roof and you would like to um, not only consume but you would also like to sell it so and that takes flexible tariffs and that's where the regulator comes in and we see an example so that could be for example for um, um, Indonesia um, very um, a, a good idea um, and what we see the example, and that's actually also what Monica shared with me yesterday. Uh, yesterday. So please, Monica, add um, when I miss something from the conversation we had. But I, I really like that idea. What they do in Mexico is they have industry um, parks, and there they have very um, the power stability is very moderate. So in order to avoid blackouts, they have now they put up solar panels on their rooftops. And but that sometimes then also leads to oversupply. So they have more energy than they can actually um, consume. And this is where they would like to bring in um, or they would like to share that or sell it to the population in Mexico. So they are already doing their own business model, have a new revenue stream, um, but they need to participate in the market, which again takes the regulator approach. And and that is um, and so they're currently negotiating with them in order to make that possible. So that could also be an option, for example, for Indonesia, where you have all these scattered islands and not can go with one single solution. But Monica, maybe did I miss anything, or would you like to add something to this example? No, wonderful, nicely explained, and um, we have already started with this peer-to-peer -peer energy trading use case a couple of years ago. 
Um, mm -hmm. Our first project was in uh, Brooklyn, in New York. Um, but there we really uh, saw that, that there were a lot of open regulatory issues. And this is why I said it's really hard um, to uh, implement it if, there, if the regulator does not fulfill the needs which we have from the energy market. And this is something we are currently in, in discussion with them. And we see um, that there is now an open mind. And I, I believe that these uh, use cases will come soon. Great, great. Okay. So where else do you see opportunities for, for blockchain in this region? Um, how do you see these further in the case of blockchain technologies adoption by the sector? And where do you see the biggest impact of the technology? For example, how will it make a difference to key players in the market currently, like the utilities and, and consumers? Mm, yeah, so um, here I would like to refer um, to four different ways of new business models and how this can have an impact. And um, number one is the traceability and tra transparency where you have opportunities in order to use blockchain. Number two is the market decentralization, which is obviously very um, favorable for the Asian region. Then we have IoT and smart devices and finance and payments. But what does it actually mean? So for traceability and transparency, for example, what we find um, very interesting is the origin certification. So there you can track and but also prove that you have green energy, again, with the example of the solar panel. So what if you can, um, usually people will pay a premium, at least that's something we see, you would pay a premium in order to have access to green energy. And then on the other side, you can, um, you can um, yeah, bring in the token model or um, say that um, because of the carbon dioxide you have um, saved, you can offset like, carbon certificates, or you can bring in um, the ETS, the so-called emission trading system, which then goes to the market decentralization because that brings you to a wholesale market. So all of a sudden you'll be able to trade those, those um, certificates, um, but also around the world, not only in your region. And that again opens up new revenue streams. If you connect that, for example, with energy storage or batteries, which can also be in the region very beneficial, um, you can then um, program those smart contracts and they feed energy into the grid, for example, for grid stability reasons. Um, so you can automate those processes, for example, also again with the blockchain or for EV charging, you can make it very transparent for the cars that are charging. Do they really charge green energy? Because that's what the electric vehicle is all about. And, um, and, and again, you can go into those trading mechanisms and you have all this um, information for transparency. And lastly, for the finance and payments, this is what we touched upon already is um, the smart contract payment, for example, with the um, payment automation and our example, automated paper use, or with the connect to evolve where we're looking for new kind of investments or so crowd investment or crowd donators. So these are all the different options that you have and, and many more. I just wanted to give you a few examples. Sure, sure. So some, some real um, opportunities for, for blockchain in the region. Um, my next question is, is, is moving away from this slightly. Um, blockchain and, and many of the next gen technologies that, are, uh, that we're seeing at the moment are, are being driven by startups. We've seen a lot of those who have participated in our own Initiate program. Um, the fairly limited energy startup scene here in Southeast Asia has been hit by uh, the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, um, with, with some sources of, of financing drying up. How is the startup scene in Europe holding up, and, and do you see it uh, impacting uh, necessary developments in this space? Yeah, so I, I think we need to also look at this question in, in also a different angle, because the energy um, startups, I think globally they are not responding to the current problem, and that is COVID-19, right? Mm -hmm. So that is um, a startup is not um, or any um, innovation. It's all uh, not only um, always about investment. It's also about timing. So maybe the timing, giving really the struggle of or the global struggle of a pandemic, pandemic, is um, catering to their problems as well. So it might not only be the investments. Whereas on the other side, and this is what we see in Europe, there has been clearly a, um, a dip in March, but that is picking up again. So um, investments are um, being done um, again. However, um, startups tend to you know, only be surviving for a couple of months. So hopefully they have survived. Mm -hmm. Or what we also see 
um, to this point earlier, some really pivot their business model because they see the offerings they bring in right now, it's not catering to the needs and they just simply change the idea. Okay, okay. Um, I, I, as, as we just discussed then, uh, blockchain and a large amount of, of the tech disrupting global energy systems in recent times has, has been in the realm of, of startups. Siemens, though, is, is most definitely not a startup. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what you guys are doing in this space? Do you have a blockchain solution yourselves? Uh, yeah, of course. I mean, uh, <laughs> we've been very engaged, specifically um, Monica. I mean, uh, uh, we do a lot in that space. And um, and just to the point of, you know, startups, of course, Siemens clearly is not a startup, right? We are very big, or Siemens Energy, um, um, to be more precise. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is a very important tool for us. And if that only means to adapt also the qualities of the startup, right? Working like a startup, being more agile. So we're trying to copy paste, of course, also the good things of the startup mm -hmm. because sure. per se we are slower. However, and that's also the reason because we are, tend to be slow, that's why we love to work with startups because we can learn a lot from them. They have the, the great ideas. They have the, um, the, the pace. They um, work in their own environment. So that's where we clearly um, profit and benefit from there. And together with them, we can then develop new digital offerings or also service. Um, services to stabilize the customer's profitability, which is very um, important to us, of course, because um, we want to make sure or we actually dedicate ourselves that we can pre prepare and um, support the customers or our customers with regards to the challenges of the future. And there will be always challenges. And this is why it's so important for us to work with startup to have the speed, but also to learn from them. Mm -hmm. Sure. Sure, sure. Okay. Well, look, um, Maria, Monica, that, that brings me to the end of my questions. Uh, I'd just like to take this opportunity to, to thank you both very, very much for, for joining us. Um, it was some really interesting insights, uh, a nice, probably one of the nicest uh, introductions to blockchain that I've heard. Maria, that example of the, the, the mirrors has definitely made it a lot clearer for me. Um, so, look, uh, guys, thank you very, very much for, for taking the time to join us. I'm really, really very grateful. Thank you. Thank you very much.